How big was Denmark in the Viking Age? So Denmark today can be divided into Jylland, Fun, Sjælland and Løland. Jylland is known in England as Jutland and is the large peninsula with the three largest islands being Fun, Sjælland and Løland. Uh, Sjælland is also where you have today the capital Copenhagen uh, or Copenhagen. I'm going to try and use the Danish pronunciations in this video and the names as well. Although, of course, we have Germany to the south and Sweden across the Øresund, which is the water between Sjælland and Sweden, where there is now a large bridge and to the north we of course also have Norway across the water across which is known as the Kattegat. Now back in the Viking Age Denmark's borders were somewhat larger than today and probably looked a bit more like this. So in the very south we have Schleswig which was added which is now part of Germany. It was actually taken over in 1864 by the Prussians in the Dano-Prussian War. As well across the Ødesund in what's now Sweden, we have Skåne. This province actually used to probably belong to the Danes and the Danish kings, and a little bit more about that later on. As well as further up the coast, the now Swedish province of Helen. And even further up, if we look at the map of Scandinavia as a whole, even parts of Norway. Um, so, for example, the Ostfold, the very bit in red in the north there, was part of the Danish hegemony and spoke Old East Norse for quite a while. And for us this might seem a little strange because we're used to the map of Scandinavia being divided like this. It makes sense when we look down on it from above that those islands closest to the Jutlandic Peninsula would belong to Denmark and then what's across the water is a separate entity because it's nice and clear on a map. But in history things are often very different than from this eagle-eyed view of the world. This however only takes the geographical aspect of water into consideration. If we actually look at a map of Scandinavia and look at some other geographical features, like for instance the very large mountains and then heavily forested areas here in Norway, you can start to get a different picture. And it's very difficult to understand exactly how the kingdoms in Scandinavia formed if we don't first take a look at the geography, because it was a very difficult feat to get from place to place. Now something can be found in the etymology as well of Norway, which is literally the north way, the way to the north. And so the Kingdom of Norway, when we talk about it in a Scandinavian context, initially means these areas, these fjords along the coast that go up the way in the very west of Norway. That was what Norway meant, rather than being the more modern country in the boundaries that we are familiar with today. Now, one reason for this as well is that going from here to here across this mountain range would have taken weeks. It would have taken an incredibly long time and it was very difficult to communicate across that way. Whereas going in a boat along the coast and going up was much easier and that's what people did which is why that's where the political entity formed. Of course it was a lot faster for them, the people in the east of Norway, in these regions that we think belong to Denmark and we have a good case for saying belong to Denmark it was a lot easier for them to go across the Kattegat to northern Yilen and to communicate with the people there and that's ultimately what they did. As well, we can see this back in other places throughout this period, for instance in Dol Reader, which was in the north of Ireland, as well as in Argyll and Scotland. It makes more sense for them to go across the water, it would have been much faster, because again I've highlighted on the map the Drum Alban, or the Spine of Alban as it's called, which is a mountain range which made it very hard for the people to cross over the mountain range and go into the mainland of Scotland, where you had for a very long time a a uh, Brythonic speaking culture, a Pictish culture, whereas in this area which it was much easier to go across in a little boat to the north of Ireland, this is where they started to initially speak the Guadelic language, the Q Celtic languages, which later subsumed Pictish uh, as the main language of Gaelic or Gaelic in Scotland at the time. So we see this happening here as well, which suggests that that's something similar to what happened in Scandinavia at the time. Um, obviously it being a lot easier to travel by boat than by road because um, in in Ireland and that part of Scotland the Romans never built roads but in Denmark it's quite the same so it's easier to go by sea than it was to go by boat so uh, the by over the roads or over the mountains or woods or marshes or that kind of thing so actually the first time we hear about Denmark is on two rune stones from quite close to each other in the second half of the 10th century both found at Yelling now the first one reads King Gorm made this monument in memory of Tura his wife Denmark's betterment now this is the first rune stone and it was erected somewhere before the year 950 by a guy called King Gorm who was called um, King Gorm den Gamla in Danish which means King Gorm the Old. And now his son actually put up another one, although it's in this one the first time that we hear Tanmarka. Oh. 
is happening here as well, which suggests that that's something similar. Well, I guess history with Hilbert is a robot confirmed. <laughs> As I was saying, his son King Harold also erected a runestone, which read, King Harold ordered this monument made in memory of Gorm, his father, and in memory of Tudor, his mother, that Harold, who won for himself all of Denmark and Norway, and made the Danes Christian. Now this again is interesting, this is the second mention of a unified Danish kingdom, which is literally transcribed as Tanmark, although ultimately this is Denmark. And Denmark is interesting because in the etymology of the word, we get another sense of what is meant. It comes from Den and Mark, which really means Dane March. Now the March in this sense is the sense of a borderland. It's what marks, demarcates the border between two people. So for again, if we look across the water to the British Isles, we have the Marches, the Welsh Marches, which was the border region between the Welsh Celtic speakers to the west and then the Germanic English speakers to the east and is still a region you can visit today. Uh, also in Lord of the Rings, you have the Redemark, uh, which I covered in my video about Rohan if you're interested. So you see it a few times and that's what's meant. So really what we mean by Denmark, is the border of the Danes, the border of, if you cross over which, you are in the land of the Danes where the Danes lived. Now, it's interesting to have a look at when this would have come about as one unified kingdom. Now, around the year 800, Charlemagne defeats the Saxons, the original Saxons in the north of Germany, and this pushed the Frankish Empire's border up to the border of the land of the Danes, the March of the Danes. And we see around this time that there's this construction of a great fort or string of forts, these defensive earthworks that are put up called the Danavirke. And the Danavirke are literally the Dane works, um, and they were these defensive fortifications that were put up. Now, this is significant because around this time, we don't know of many kings before this time in Denmark because they weren't writing things down. They weren't Christian yet, so they didn't have the ability to write more than short messages in runes. However, the fact that they could assemble all of these workers to build this huge fortification along the border suggests there must have been some kind of very strong centralized political authority in Yilin especially um, that could have organized this to happen and we do hear around the time the turn of the 9th century of a very powerful king called Godfred although I'll probably make a separate video about him and what we know because he's ultimately the first real named character that we can possibly say was the first king of some kind of unified Denmark um, now as well, what's interesting about this time is that it's around this time that the uh, two trading hubs, one at Ribe and the other at Hedeby, become very important and start to flourish a lot more. And one of the reasons why we think that they flourished a lot more is that there was more centralization and stabilization in Denmark. Um, again, we could even posit that Southern Yilen then had one ruler because he then would be able to control the seas around Ribe and Hedeby, protect the traders there from pirates and various brigands and such and that would mean that more trade could flow freely. Also, that would be a positive feedback loop because if there was more trade, more of that trade and money would be going into that ruler's pocket and so he'd be able to strengthen and stabilize the region more so that more traders would feel safe to come and to trade there. Uh, which is essentially a positive feedback loop. Uh, these two areas are both important as well, and it's one of the reasons that Denmark did so well, is that the North Sea trade came up and traded with Ariba, um, often in the hands of the Frisians in this case, so things like wine from the Rhineland, um, millstones, grain, that kind of thing, all came from there. Um, and then also you had the Baltic trade lanes going into Hedeby, which is why it's on the shores of the Baltic Sea there. There's also a canal that cuts across uh, from the North Sea to uh, Hedeby, which made it easier for, you didn't have to go right the way around the Kattegat, um, which suggests that they might not have had control of the North if they wanted to keep that trade lane there. Also, it cuts, you know, the journey time uh, significantly shorter. So the, the people who were in control of these trading centers would have become very powerful very quickly. And this is really the process of centralization in Denmark and adds towards that. Um, now, it's interesting as well that in the 13th century, we see in King Valdemar's land registry that the way that they did the taxes was based on three provinces in Yilen, Xielen and in Skorne as well. And it's probable that this actually went back to a much older tradition, that these were the three largest petty kingdoms. And we have evidence for, obviously, uh, Yilen being centralized fairly early on. And um, also in Xielen, we have at Leire, um, a royal palace that was dug up. And Skorna as well has a very interesting history with um, probably being the last petty kingdom to be captured. I'll touch upon that in this video. But if people are interested, I'll make a video on Skorna and the earls there um, because they seem to have been some kind of 
semi-autonomous area that was quite often in rebellion to the more um, Western Danish kings at the time. And it is King Gorm who we are told by the Frankish Annals and Chronicles that he defeats a certain Gnupa. I think it's Adam of Bremen writes that he defeats a King Gnupa. Um, and that then he founded sort of the head of this dynasty that came to be known as the Yelling Dynasty at Yelling in Yilen. And then it's his son, Harold Bluetooth, who builds a lot of these fortresses. Now, he is named on the runestone, of course, as the first king. Uh, he unified the Danes and took for himself Norway. And he builds a lot of these fortresses. And my suggestion for these fortresses is that, and the suggestion of other historians also, is that these fortresses were in the places that he needed to control. So this would support the idea that his dynasty was fairly comfortable in Yilen. Obviously, you have the Danavirke to the south, um, but that perhaps the north of Yilen had their own rulers. That's why he builds the two at Agersborg and Furkat, um, and also the others in Shielen and then in Skorne as well, that these were consolidating new areas that he and perhaps his father Gorm had helped to consolidate and to take power in which is quite interesting. Now, it's under his son, Svein Forkbeard, that the dynasty's capital is moved from Yelling, where you have these monuments and the church built by Harald, uh, and, of course, the two runestones, to a new place in Sjælen uh, at Roskilde. And one of the reasons for this could be that the Danish kingdom was expanding eastwards, and that the reason for moving it was that the seat then also needed to be in the middle of this new empire. So say that Skorna had been success successfully pacified by Harald, then it would make more sense to move the capital more to the middle of the Dane march, because of course you have this, this tract of land north as well, which was Danish. So it would make it more secure in the middle of the Uresund. Um, also Yelling wasn't at sea, whereas Roskilde was. And as you'll know if you've watched other videos and know a bit about Svein Folkbeard, is that he was a very mobile king, uh, doing a lot of raiding into England so it would make sense for him to have a base that was on the coast so that he could go and assemble his fleet faster. Now his son was Knut um, who became known as Knut the Great in England and it's interesting because he does a lot of building projects in Lund uh, which is in Skorna and there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest that there was still quite a bit of trouble with the uh, the Jarls of Skorna. There's a very famous character called Thorkel um, Hinhave in Old Norse which is the, the tall, Thorkel the tall. And he does a lot of building projects in Lund, possibly again to pacify and to shift a centre of power away from these Jarls and into his own hands. Again, again, moving eastwards, also in the Swedish town of Sigtuna, there are some coins that are minted in his name, although this can be interpreted in a number of ways. One is that he was actually in power there. We know that some of his relations were the Swedish kings at the time, uh, the King Olaf, for instance, although he does later go to war with this king. Although another interpretation is simply that they were copying coins that he had made with his name, so it's saying uh, King Knut, and then that they, the Swedish minters, would see that coin and they'd simply copy it without, you know, copying over the symbolism that, oh, that means that he's our king now. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that he really was their king, they were just copying the coin because it looked nice, as we see across the ancient world at this time, which is quite interesting. Now, as I said, if you have watched other videos of mine, like the one of the Vikings in England, you know that Knut and Svein both conquered England at various points in the early 11th century. And an interesting thing is that when these great armies came home, um, quite a few of them appear to have been from Western Sweden, because we find a lot of runestones in Western Sweden commemorating these guys that came back from the various wars with Svein and Knut uh, from the West, and then that their family members built these runestones, had these runestones carved in memory of their brothers, fathers, sons who had fallen in the West during these campaigns. So two of them here I've highlighted, there are many more if you want to find more examples. So this one here says, Gislaug had this cut in memory of a son, Spjallbothi, Ulfur, Ingvar, Holmfaster, Geire. They made the bridge in memory of their brother Thane, who perished abroad, and in memory of Björn, their father, may God help their souls. And that's from the U363 runestone. Now this is interesting because this mentions the title Thane, which is used. And there are two titles that come into play here. One is Thane and the other is Dreng, or Thane and Drenger in Old Norse. And the interesting thing about this um, is that these titles appear to have been given by the various warlords who fought in England. And it's quite possible that these guys who came back would then have seen themselves or been seen by Svein and by Knut 
as then agents of the Danish king, who then go into areas of Western Sweden. And then again, they, they might have seen themselves as being loyal to these men because they had obviously sworn oaths, they had fought for them. So it's possible that this was another Danish move, another uh, piece of Danish expansion into Western Sweden. Now the other says, Olaf raised the stone in memory of Silva or Solva, his son, he died in the West. Um, and again, that's dying in the West, that's dying as fighting for Svein or for Knut. Um, and there are many rune stones that are like this. So anyway, this has just been some food for thought about the sort of the Danish um, Empire, the Danish Kingdom at the start, at the, at the Viking Age. Um, and also how much it's changed because quite a lot of the time in my videos I talk about obviously the Vikings and about ones from Norway and from Denmark but it's very hard to sort of separate out what exactly we mean by these various terms because they are very different to what we mean by them today. Now if people are interested do let me know in the comments below I've been thinking I might make a video about how Denmark became one country, why it was centralized and also why Denmark really dominated the Viking Age in Scandinavia um, which it did as well as some other factors like the Jarls of Skorne um, and how they were so independent minded and things like that. So no, it's been a bit of a rambly one but I hope you guys don't mind, I thought this was an interesting topic. Um, also to consider I have actually written an essay on this very recently um, which goes into a lot more detail and has citations and a bibliography if you guys want to read more uh, where I got the information for this video from. So check out the link in the description below if you want to read that essay, uh, which you are welcome to do. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a couple grammatical mistakes in, I think. Um, I'll try and iron them out before I put them up. Um, and also there is, of course, the merch competition for t-shirts, hoodies, phone cases, posters, etc., which you can join. Just email me your designs. That will be absolutely awesome. Uh, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. I've been History with Hilbert, and I'll see you all again very soon.